You're welcome to the Standard World Broadcasting Network. We're continuing on the episode, The Operation of Lion Spirits. Uh, we'll be looking at the Feast of Jeroboam. But this time around, we're going to be looking at two characters, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Let's call it the context between Rehoboam and Jeroboam to give us an idea of the triumph of truth over lie. We're going to be telling a very interesting story that connects four key personalities. David, Solomon, Jeroboam, Rehoboam. Now, David was a man of covenant, a man that was in covenant with God, the covenant of salt. And God promised David to have a son on his throne, that he will not fail to have one to sit upon his throne. By a powerful covenant that he meant, things that even if his children will go into error his covenant with Israel will not fail upon the strength of the covenant of David this story is framed the story of David of Solomon of Rehoboam of Jeroboam is an interplay of divine acts between a, a faithful covenant son who God is duty bound to keep covenant and the promise of God is even if your seed will depart from the way I will chastise them but I will not take away mercy from them completely because of the power of the covenant. There we see Solomon brought into the scene, son of David, son of a covenant man, who by the lawyer heart he displayed at the beginning, entered the covenant with the Lord. And God began to establish Solomon and made his kingdom extremely great and gave Israel rest round about in the time of Solomon. But we saw how Solomon began to overdraw from the divine goodwill. He began to marry many strange women. He began to become unfaithful to God. Well, in the declaration of Solomon, Solomon's house began to suffer. God began to allow certain chastisement to come upon Solomon. And that was the reason for Jeroboam in the first place, to chastise Solomon. He says, I will for this chastise David, but not forever. Because God's covenant will not fail. And we know after Solomon came Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And in the time of Rehoboam, the kingdom was divided. And ten tribes given to Jeroboam, who was the beneficiary of the backsliding that began in the time of Solomon. So, Rehoboam was just a child of circumstances, a victim of circumstances. Judgment has already been determined upon the house of Solomon. So, Rehoboam simply played into it. But within that child the, the, the uh, childishness of Rehoboam, when he took the counsel of the young men, rather than the counsel of wisdom, the kingdom was lost. Ten tribes went to Jeroboam. But we can see element of faithfulness in Rehoboam, although not entirely faithful as David his father. But within that element of faithfulness, he kept loyalty in worship. God seeks men who will be loyal to the true worship of God. Because of 
the lower disposition, although measurably, that Rehoboam exhibited or demonstrated towards God, God strengthened him in spite of the fact that the house of Solomon, whom he represented, was under chastisement. What am I trying to say? I'm saying that a man of covenant, a child of covenant, even if he is in error or in wrong, God's chastisement is to bring him or her back to focus. So a child of covenant under divine disfavor cannot be at the mercy of a man who does not have the same covenant with God under favor. Complicated, but ex extremely true. Let me state it again. A child of covenant under divine disfavor because of apparent wrong or momentary wrong cannot be permanently at the mercy of an intruder who is under divine favor because of the error of the man in covenant. And that's the story between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The house of Jeroboam and the house of Rehoboam. One, Jeroboam was blessed by God. The blessing upon Jeroboam was because God needed to chastise the house of David. As a result of the error of Solomon. And so a blessing came upon Jeroboam to afflict Israel. To afflict David. Not forever. But Jeroboam did not have that kind of covenant with God. He came in just as, you know, uh, an intruder. The righteous was not keeping to righteousness. And so the wicked became empowered over and above. But that does not mean that Jeroboam, you know, should overdraw on God's free will, God's grace. He taught that in wickedness, he will permanently triumph over that which is true. No way. Lie enthroned can never overcome truth dethroned. Enthroned lie is for a moment. Dethroned truth is also for a moment. Truth will triumph. Lie will eventually be lie. Now let's move on to the details of this complicated story. But I think if you follow very carefully, you will see the sense in it. But let us begin from um, Psalm chapter 79, just to show the very the power and the strength of God's covenant, because that is very important in the story of these four characters, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Jeroboam. So we go to Psalm 89. It depicts God's covenant and God's faithfulness in keeping to covenant despite the unfaithfulness of his covenant people. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed, your children, I will establish forever. And build up thy throne to all generations. Extremely powerful. I'm going to establish your seed, David, forever. But we know that David had many children. Some of them were not as faithful as David. Yet, in spite of their unfaithfulness, the power of covenant was at work. So that in the time of chastisement, whenever they turn to the Lord, God's power of God's faithfulness returned unto them. So thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Now let's go over to verse 20. The same um, Psalm 89 verse 20 now. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil 
Have I anointed him? There is an anointing on the seed. There is an anointing on the father. The anointing of David remains to his children. God may momentarily withdraw his presence because of, you know, uh, unfaithfulness. But only to use that as a means of turning them back to God. That's the way the Lord builds his church. He will never withdraw mercy from his people. Because of the covenant he has with Christ, he will continue to build his church. And the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. So we read on. David is a type of Christ. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him. Whatever we can say about David and his children, we can transfer the same to the greater son of David, Jesus Christ, and his church. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. Have I anointed him? With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him. That means David's children will not be at the mercy of the enemy exacting upon them. Remember, we know that the devil moves about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But let us resist him standing steadfastly in the faith. So long as we continue to stand steadfastly in the faith, God will give us triumph over the enemy. With whom my hand shall be established, and my arm also shall strengthen him. Verse 22. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the sons of wickedness afflict him, and I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn, his strength be exalted. God never withdraws faithfulness and mercy from his people. They are permanently with his people. The strength of the Lord with the horn, the strength of the Lord's people will be exalted in his name, Jesus. Look at verse 25. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. Wow, glory. The power of the covenant shall be extended over the nations, the sea, the right hand in the rivers. That means the Lord's people will continue to have victory over the masses of humanity. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make his firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. The firstborn of the covenant is stronger than the kings of the earth, than the king of sin. Wow. 28. My mercy will I keep for him forever. That means God has reserved mercy for his people. I keep mercy. Despite their backsliding, despite their disobedience, I reserve mercy forever. Even though I will chastise them because of backsliding, because of sin, because of disobedience, but I will keep mercy forever. Because in their chastisement, when they turn to me, my mercy will be kickstarted again. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And I will begin to show them mercy. That is very, that is a great word of hope for God's church. God is going to build his church. Although the church may suffer momentary defeat, but the church, when the church begins to rethink and repent and return to the Lord, divine power, divine faithfulness will come. Remember the story of the prodigal son. Right in the land of backsliding, he came to his right senses and he was recovered back to his father's house. 
and restored to the place of fellowship and to the place of authority in the Father's house. So he is saying, my mercy I will keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law. Just as God's children sometimes forsake the word of the Lord. If his children forsake my law. God is using this metaphor of Rehoboam, Solomon, David, to show that he will remember the church. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod. Exactly. The rod and reproof bring correction. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Wow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He says, I will visit their transgression with the rod, the rod of correction, and their iniquity with stripes. The whip of correcting children. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Oh, we bless the Lord. His faithfulness to you, he will not suffer to fail. The momentary difficulties you may be going through may just be a sign that you need to return to the Lord. You need to remember where you have fallen. You need to repent and begin to come back to God. The covenant you have with God will never fail. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. The Lord has proclaimed blessings upon you. He will never recall it. Oh, glory God, hallelujah. He said, every good and perfect gift coming from above, it comes from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither is any shadow of turning. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Although Solomon's kingdom was divided at the time of Rehoboam because of foolishness, but the Lord says, I will never lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. And his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in the heaven. Now this background in Psalm 89 is very important for us to understand the interplay of divine forces. When God brings chastisement to his children, it is not that the wicked will have permanent mastery over them. Never. When God prospers the wicked just to occupy the space that was left because of the unfaithfulness of the righteous, that does not mean he has forsaken the righteous and it, it, that should not enter into the head of the wicked to think that their time of lead and power is permanent. No, 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 no. Never, never, never. It can never be. So let's go back again to this story as we find in Second Chronicles chapter 11. Now we've been reading from Second Kings, uh, no, sorry, First Kings chapter 11, First Kings chapter 12, the entire story of Solomon's backsliding and then um, Rehoboam coming to the scene and Rehoboam exhibiting fully and Jeroboam coming to the scene and giving 10 tribes. If you be following the the, the series, uh, I believe you will be able to follow very clearly. But go on, I believe, somewhere along the line, it will become very clear to you. We turn to Second Chronicles chapter 11. 
This begins Yobuam reacting to the fact that ten tribes were taken from him and given to Jeroboam. Remember who Rehoboam was, son of Solomon, son of David, a man in covenant with God. The calamity that came to Rehoboam was because of the unfaithfulness of Solomon, his father, not because of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was only naive. He only took the counsel of the young men, his age mates, who said to, to him, tell Israel, my little finger is bigger than the loins of my father. In fact, whereas my father chastised you with whips, I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. That was, you know, a kind of administrative um, strategy to evoke fear into the people so that they can be loyal. Anyway, it backfired. Israel simply said, to your tents, O Israel. And Jeroboam became the beneficiary. True prophet Ahijah, a prophet of God, came. And the Lord, by his word, gave ten tribes. It's as if there were ten gifts. And God took, sorry, twelve gifts. He took ten and gave to one man. That man was not really deserving. But it came to him because of the affliction to, uh, on David's house. Due to the backsliding of David. But remember, a covenant child can be afflicted. That does not mean the relationship of the covenant child is broken. No. No, 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 no. God is still the father of a wayward covenant child. Fellowship can be broken. No relationship. Fellowship itself will be restored at repentance. When repentance is done. So let's go on. In chapter 11 of Second Chronicles, let's read. And Rehoboam was, was come to Jerusalem. He gathered the house of Judah. And Benjamin, a hundred and four score thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. It, it was like an insult. How can the kingdom given to me by Solomon, my father, be divided? And ten of the tribes go to an intruder. A neophyte who was even a servant of my father. So it, it, it was grievous to him. So let's read on. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Wow. Do you imagine? In the midst of kingdom split. Kingdom split. You know how painful it is for kingdom to be split. And one intruder has taken ten tribes. And you are left with two. And then you summon your military men to go and fight. And then the word of the Lord came. They are your brothers. That tells us some mystery in church split. The split of brethren. Brethren in commotion. Yes, because it is always because of sin. Because of unrighteousness. Because something is not being faithful to God's order. I'm not saying that. The ten are right, the two are wrong, or the two are right, the ten are wrong. Somewhere along the line, there is an error somewhere. But the foundation of God standeth sure. Let every man examine his heart. To be sure, he is not playing out negative prophecy. He is not just... You know, an intruder who is playing out on a momentary, temporary blessing that will dry out. 
Let every man examine his heart to be sure his, his heart is right with God. But what am I trying to say? God's word came through the prophet Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel, in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus said the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house. Glory, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Now, there are people who are able to sustain quarrel in the house of God. They are able to continue to fight their brethren. The Lord, through his word, said, Return every man to his house. Don't fight your brother. Do not claim, I am right. He is wrong. I must fight him. No. Go back to the Lord. The Lord will resolve every conflict. And I am so delighted to know that Rehoboam obeyed. Rehoboam hearkened to the word of the Lord. Although Rehoboam felt he had the right to fight, he needed to recover the house of Solomon. He needed to recover the ten tribes. But the word of the Lord was more important to Rehoboam than possessing the ten tribes or bringing back the ten tribes that we are lost. But is the word of the Lord important to you? There are many sustaining the quarrel. is more important to them than the word of the Lord. They are willing to continue to fight their brethren. They are willing to scatter everything just to maintain their selfish interests. And that's what we saw incidentally in Jeroboam. Even the ten tribes he took, he could not maintain it. Selfishness entered in. And he rather than serve the Lord who gave him ten gifts, he became loyal and, sorry, disloyal and unfaithful. And that's why we are looking at the contest between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam versus Jeroboam. Jeroboam is a symbol of the lie, lying spirit. Rehoboam is the type of a covenant man in error. So, a man acting lie is ever a loser. The man who is in covenant, although in error, is not at the mercy of a liar who orchestrates, who frames, who develops, who builds on lie. Because we have this kind of children in the house of God. The Rehoboam and the Jeroboam, they are all in the house of God. The house of God is in an evolving state. You know, we have the Rehoboam company who are suffering because of some mistake, but they are real people of the covenant. Don't worry, return to the Lord. Because as the word of the Lord came, return to the Lord, the Lord will return to you. That is what Rehoboam needed to do. Let us see how Rehoboam began to respond to God's word. Second Chronicles chapter 11, now we go to verse 5. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Only two tribes. He did not go and began, uh, and began to mourn his loss. Oh Lord, he, he, did, he didn't begin to organize a pity party. Oh, and bitterness party. Lord, Lord, look at that, my brother. He took ten tribes. Lord, Lord. And he never began to conceive mischief. He simply obeyed the word of the Lord. I pray for all God's people to return to the Lord. Whether you are two or twenty, or 20 or 2,000, or 2,000 or, or 20,000, it doesn't matter. Return to the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Do not begin to look at the momentary blessing of your neighbor and allow the spirit of envy, the spirit of jealousy, the spirit of strife that divides and destroys the church. Return. So Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. 
He built even Bethlehem and Etam and Tekoa. You can, can you imagine from two tribes, he began to consolidate. He began to build. Are you using the giftings of God on your life? Or are you more envious at the gifting of somebody else? Look, there's something God has given you. Use the gifts that he has given you. Steer up the gifts that have been given you. That little light, let it shine. Be faithful to that which God has put in you. Don't begin to look at the man who seemed to have so many gifts and then um, you have one reason to be jealous or envious. No, be faithful. Return to the Lord and do that which the Lord has given you. So Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense. In Judah, he built even Bethlehem and Etam and Tekoa and Bethzor and Shoko and Adulam. Wow, prosperity. And Gad and Marasha and Ziph and Adoram and Lachish and Azaka, sorry, Azeka and Zora and Ajalon and hebron wow what are you building are you building the cities of god are you building the people of god teach be instant in season and out of season the things that god has told you paul said to timothy commit to faithful men who will teach others exercise your gifts and continue to do that which god has given you build here verse 10 he built zora and ajalon and hebron which are in judah and benjamin fenced cities 11 and he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and store of victua and of oil and wine wow oil is the anointing victua food wine revelation hallelujah you can see growth in grace and in the knowledge of the lord jesus christ verse 12 and in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceedingly strong the bible says we should be strong in the lord and in the power of his might that we should put on the whole armor of god let's fortify strength within us let's not dissipate spiritual energy talking 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 gossiping blackmailing castigating build yourself on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost put yourself in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life so we can see rio Bam began to build from just two tribes left to him in every several city, he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. Glory, hallelujah. Just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. We are going to see what the other man who has ten is doing. Oh, this is the man who has two. Let us see what he's doing. So it's not so much about how many gifts you have. Whether you have all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, or you have one, or <laughs> it doesn't matter. But it is your faithfulness that matters. So we can see the faithfulness of Rio Buan. Verse 13. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coast. See what faithfulness does. Look, this man concentrated on building on the two. The Bible says he had only Judah and Benjamin to his side. Yet he built so many cities that we have seen listed here from verses 5 right to verse 11. Cities that he built with shields and spears with only Judah and Benjamin to his side. And what happened? The priests and the Levites began to gravitate towards him. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You begin to do the right thing. Goodwill will come on your path. The priests and the Levites, the true 
children of God, those who love the truth, those who love God, will look for that which is true. They will seek that which is true. Look, when Jesus was born, wise men from the east came all the way to worship him. You stand with God and be faithful to the little God has given you and see if that little will not be blessed. The Lord will bless that little for his glory, never for your glory. In, and when the Lord begins to raise you up, never allow it to enter into your head. It was pros prosperity that entered into Solomon's head. In prosperity, he deviated. So never deviate, but remain loyal to God. Verse 14. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam, wow, that is Rehoboam's competitor now. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. Rehoboam was building, focused, only two tribes. Jeroboam was building his own, fortifying his, you know, trying to build for himself, not for God. And he cast out the priest from executing the office of the priest. Verse 15. He ordained him priest for the high places and for the devils <laughs> and for the calves which he had made. So if you go to 1 Kings 11, and first Kings 12, you will see all the sins of Jeroboam. How Jeroboam began to conceive mischief in his heart. He said that if the people continue to go to Judah to worship God, then their heart will be to the king that is in Judah. They will kill me. And, you know, he made two calves. He put one in Dan, the other in, um, is it um, Bethel? And he claimed that they are the gods that brought them from Egypt. And it became a sin to Israel. So Jeroboam was busy building fake things, setting up abomination of desolation. Look at what the Bible says here. He ordained for him priest for the high places and for the devils. Rather than priest of God, satanic people, he brought into priesthood for devils and for the calves for Baal, which he had made. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. What Jeroboam was doing, sorry, what Rehoboam was doing attracted faithful men. All those who desire God began to seek for truth. That is what is going on. Let the people of God begin to look to the Lord. All those who are called of God stand for the truth. Those who desire God will look for the truth. Praise the name of the Lord. Those who desire a lie will go to the lie. But those who desire God will look for the truth. Verse 17. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, son of Solomon, strong. Three years. For three years, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Wow. At least faithfulness of three years. We know somewhere along the line, Rehoboam began to have some other ideas. You know, God chastised him, but God still blessed him when he recovered himself. We don't want to go into the details, but the chastisement of Rehoboam brought a king of Egypt to attack Judah. But as Rehoboam reorganized himself and humbled himself, the Lord removed the wrath from him. He did not allow him to be completely overpowered by the enemy. God's mercy was upon him. But what is important is that Rehoboam was faithful for three years and it was a foundation that his son, Abijah, inherited. Now, let us go to the side of 
Jeroboam, to see what Jeroboam was doing. Well, I refer you to 1 Kings chapter 23. Because we dealt with it in the previous episode, we are not going to deal with it now. But on the side of Rehoboam, he was setting sons of Belial for priests. Setting people to worship Satan instead of worship God. Building his own empire instead of building the kingdom of God. And what are you building? God's house or your own personal estate? God's kingdom or your own personal kingdom? God's church or your own personal empire? That is it. If you know, if you build on a lie, you will reap a lie. If you build on truth, you will reap the reward of truth. And um, so we can see what was going on on the side of Jeroboam. It was abomination. But on the side of Rehoboam, righteousness and truth. The conflict between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, let us begin to see what, who will win. The man building for himself. Or the man building for God. The man amassing his own empire. Or the man focused only on the will of God. Who is going to win? Glory, hallelujah. Let's turn to uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 13. It's going to be a very interesting story. And we're going to cap it up here. Now. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign. You know what? Abijah is the son of Rehoboam. Although Rehoboam was not so perfect in his heart with God, Abijah came up after the death of Rehoboam. But, um, Rehoboam, as we have said, was not entirely perfect. But at least for three years, he did what was right. And we can see even that legacy of righteousness, what impact it had. So there was a contest between the son of Abijah. That is the fifth man now. So we are talking about the story of David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, and Jeroboam. So the lineage of righteousness and the lineage of unrighteousness. Let us see what happens. One building on truth in spite of human frailty. The other acting strangely. Even one, that is Jeroboam whom God has blessed and established. And suddenly he began to manifest error in his heart. So Second Chronicles chapter 13. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel, of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. We titled this conflict between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. But the real player is Rehoboam's son, Abijah, who is the fourth generation of David's child. Remember David to Solomon, Solomon to Rehoboam, Rehoboam to Abijah. Abijah versus Jeroboam, who benefited from Solomon's backsliding. So there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war. Even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men being mightier men of valor. Wow. Can you imagine the battle scenario? Small Abijah had just half or, you know, just half of the military might of Jeroboam. Jeroboam was a more experienced guy. But the more experienced man 
acting a lie can never have mastery over a lesser man who stands for the truth. May the Lord help us, help you to stand for the truth. So we can see the battle array. Abijah had 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam had 800,000 chosen men. And the Bible says, being mighty men of valor, and Abijah stood upon man Zemarim, Zemarim, which is man Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam and all Israel. I'd like us to pay attention to this, it's very important. Abijah had a less formidable army, but he is a symbol of a man standing for the righteousness of God through worship. I am saying that truth overcomes lie at any time. Although lie may parade, may, may be in charge for a while, but it is never at the mercy of, uh, I mean, it does not have advantage over truth. That means truth is not at the mercy of the lie. Truth will always win. Let me put it that way. So Abijah stood upon man Zimarim, which is man Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam and all Israel. Ought ye not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever? Don't you know this? Jeroboam should have known that because the, the prophet Ahijah brought a word and said, I bless you. I establish you. For this blessing of yours, I will afflict David, but not forever. So he should know. So Abijah, Rehoboam's son, was the one trying to educate old Jeroboam, the old tycoon. Ought ye not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over, sorry, gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the son of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and had rebelled against his Lord. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belia. So who did Jeroboam have for his army? Vain men. Look, let the vain men number a million. They will never overcome the true church. The hollow church is bigger in number than the true church. That's what is happening. Jesus says broad is the way. Wide is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many that are going there. But straight is the gate, and you know, narrow is the way. Or is it straight is the way, and narrow is the gate that leads to life? And few there be that find it. So we can see the false church versus the true church, the woman versus the woman, as we saw in the book of Revelation, you know. The hallowed church fighting the true church. The hallowed church numbered several thousands more. And they have vain men. Men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. When Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted, and could not withstand them. That's true. It was the naivety of Rehoboam that led to the kingdom being divided. Even though God allowed such naivety for a greater glory. Verse 8. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David. And ye be a great multitude. 
and there are with you golden calves <laughs> which Jeroboam made you for gods. So you can see what constitutes that army. A great multitude, sons of Belial with golden calves, you know, seen on righteousness in thousands, can never defeat the forces of righteousness, even if they are few in comparison. Verse 9. Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations? Are you not trying to be like the world? There is a church today trying to be like the world. They are as influential with statesmen, with the worldly kind of leadership. Every style of the Gentile world has been imported into the denominational organized christendom it will not do divine order must be restored the true priesthood must be restored we must not have sons of belial standing as priests but men who hate covetousness men loving truth men loving righteousness that was the counsel jethro gave to moses set this man over the people they hate covetousness they love the truth they love righteousness Genuine man. That is the man that God is building with. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. But because Jeroboam had a church like the world, so he had worldly people in his army. Let's read it again, verse 9. Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and, Le and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations, other lands, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. Anyone that can pay the price, bring seven bullocks and um, seven rams to consecrate himself. Even if he's an area boy, he becomes a priest. Verse 10, but as for us, the Lord is our God. Amen. And that's what Abijah was telling Jeroboam. For us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priest which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron. And the Levites wait upon their business. Oh, this is so interesting. The Levites wait upon their business before God. Are you a Levite? Levite simply means joined to the Lord. Are you joined to the Lord in your spirit? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. That's the true Levite. They wait on their business. They listen to the Holy Spirit. And when you listen to the Holy Ghost, that which is born of God overcomes the world. You become a victor. There is victory for you when you stand as a Levite. Waiting upon your ministry, listening to the Lord, listening to what God has to say. Do not fight with physical weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Do not fight with head knowledge. Do not fight with sons of Belial. Do not fight with diplomacy and all the tricks in the books, as they may say. The Levites waited upon the Lord for their business. He says, he says this that that, that the priests which minister among us are of the children of Aaron. And the Levites wait on their business. And they born unto the Lord every morning and every evening born sacrifices and sweet incense. That means pure worship. Pure sacrifices. True worship. Hallelujah. They born unto the Lord every morning. Every evening, faithfulness, loyalty, what consistency. This is the recipe for spiritual victory. They burn incense every morning. They burn incense every evening. Your incense is your prayer. Your incense is your worship. Are you a true worshiper? Morning and evening. Not necessarily natural morning and natural evening. It just shows the consistency, the, the steadfastness, being before the Lord. Born in incense, 
worshipping God in spirit and in truth. Now, the showbread also set day in order. Wow, this showbread is the word of God. Is the word of God there? Now, first of all, born sacrifice. The offering of your life. Your, you know, living clean before God. You born incense. That means staying in the place of worship and prayer before God. Remember, you are a Levite joined to the Lord. You are the son of Aaron, the priesthood. Hallelujah. A true priestly anointing. And then they set the shoe bread in order. The shoe bread is the bread of God's presence. Is the word of the Lord there. This bread was always changed every Sabbath. That means in this house of Rio Buam, they were burning incense. They were setting the shoe bread. That just shows us the level of faithfulness in the house of Rio Buam. While Jeroboam was amassing power, building his kingdom and playing games, putting sons of Le uh, Belial for priests, casting out the Levites from doing the right thing because he wanted loyalty for himself. All this simple expression of true worship we are missing in the life of Jeroboam. And yet he had a great army, 800,000. He really had confidence in the arm of flesh. But thank God there for the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the word of God. Shoe bread was set in order upon the pure table. And the candlestick of gold with the lambs thereon to burn every evening. That's fantastic. The candlestick is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is the word brought forth by the power of the Holy Ghost. Illumination, enlightenment. That means they are enlightened in the word of God. They can see the table of shoe bread every day. Oh, glory. Look, that's what true worship is all about. Listening to the Holy Ghost. Functioning by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit revealing God's truth. And enabling the word of his presence. The table of shoe bread. The shoe bread to be kept every Sabbath. That's what the house of Rehoboam was doing. And Abijah, his son, could testify about this. We read on. We are soon going to conclude anyway. To burn every evening, for we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. You see, the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. This son of Rehoboam, Abijah, was not intimidated. He saw 800,000 men, men of valor. He only had half as, uh, half less. You know, he wasn't afraid. He stood on the power of God's righteousness. Because you love righteousness and you hate wickedness, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Keep loving righteousness. Keep hating wickedness. The anointing of God is coming upon you above all companions. And in any conflict with the power of darkness, you cannot be overrun. Verse 12. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. And his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you, O children of Israel. The priest of the Lord with sounding trumpet. That means they were declaring God's word. Are you sounding the trumpet of God? Are you speaking the mind of God? Are you declaring only what God is saying in these last days? We have priests sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. To testify against the wickedness in the house of Jeroboam. O oh, children of Israel. Fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. That was the counsel. Don't fight against the Lord's people, for you will not prosper. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment. You know, that's the trick of Jeroboam. He thinks he can always lay ambush because he laid ambush against true worship. He set an altar in Dan, 
set another one in Bethel and ambushed people. People could not go to Judah to worship God. But there were some faithful priests who left to join the true worshippers. So while Abijah was talking, Jeroboam laid ambushment. That old trick. You cannot ambush righteousness. So he, he caused an ambushment to come about behind them. You see, very tricky. So they were before Judah. An ambushment was behind them. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. It's like Judah, you are standing. You are talking righteousness, talking God. Look at, this man has made an ambushment. He has come behind you. His battle is before you and behind you. You are a goner. You will suffer. Your righteousness will bring destruction to you. That's what Jeroboam was saying. Did an ambushment. So there was something before and behind. Look at verse 14. And when, behold, the battle was before and behind. And you look back and the enemy is in your front and in your back. Look to the Lord. Stand your ground. The Lord is going to give you the victory. In this nation, the church of God will never be ambushed. The enemy comes behind us. The enemy comes in front of us. But God is going to give the church victory. There shall be victory for the church. The thing that is trying to ambush the lost people in Nigeria shall be overthrown. What is trying to ambush the program of God in the church or in the world shall be overthrown. In the name of the Lord Jesus, there shall be victory. So Jeroboam, you know, so when Judah pure worship looked back behold the battle was before and behind and they cried unto the lord amen and the priest sounded with trumpets i believe that is what the church should be doing in this nation and in the world when we see wickedness engulfing rising to swallow and overtake let us cry unto the Lord in intercession and continue to sound the trumpet. Declare those words. Speak with your mouth. With the heart man believes. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So they cried unto the Lord and the priest sounded with trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. This shout is a response to faith. It's an evidence that you believe God. You know, the Lord descended with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. It is a, it is a, it is a, it said, it said, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. It is a response of faith. It is the response that your heart, you know, that comes from your heart declared with your mouth. For the, with the heart man believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There they shouted. And as the men of Judah shouted, Oh, glory, make a shout. Give a shout. Hallelujah. Not an empty shout. A shout because there's a word in your spirit. And because you believe it, your shout is your agreement. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass. Oh, glory, hallelujah. That God smote Jeroboam. Amen. And all Israel before Abijah and Judah. I feel like jumping. It is beautiful in spite of the ambushment behind and in front the men of judah shouted and blew trumpets and as the men of judah shouted the word of god that is in their heart shouted with their mouth what they believe in their heart oh glory it came to pass so shall it come to pass in nigeria the enemies of god shall be overthrown so shall it come to pass in the world. The enemies of God shall be overthrown. So shall it come to pass in every local assembly. The things that plague the people of God will be overthrown. As the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam. Amen. And all Israel, lying spirits will be smitten. Lying spirits will be sucked out of the church. Lying spirit that is invading the house of God will be cast out. God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah. Amen. They've, Judah means 
Thou at whom thy brethren shall praise, praise with stretched out arms. That's Judah. The, the Israel who have followed the lion spirit, that is Jeroboam, because they followed Jeroboam, they fled before Judah. And God delivered them unto their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. Just like Elijah slew the prophets of Jezebel. You know, 450 prophets of Baal and 800 prophets of the groove. You know? You know? And Abijah and his, and his people slew them with great slaughter. That is how lying spirits, lying lie, wickedness will be flushed out of the church. So there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Wow. That means about, about three fifths or almost four fifths of the entire army. They brought 800,000 and 500,000 men were slain. That is, a calamity. Thus the children of Israel were brought under. Amen. That means the house of Jeroboam was brought under the house of Rehoboam. The, the man who had ten tribes was brought under the man who had two. Can, that is a big lesson to us. So it's not about how many you have. But it's about your faithfulness to the covenant of God. And God is a covenant keeping God. He keeps covenant. He shows mercy. Hallelujah. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time. And the children of Judah prevailed. True worship will prevail. Burning the lampstand will prevail. Changing the shoe bread every Sabbath will prevail. Worshipping God in spirit and in truth will prevail. Sounding the trumpet and shouting the shout of faith. Responding to God's word in your heart will prevail. Faithfulness to the covenant of David will prevail. Thus the children of Israel we are brought under at that time. And the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, better with the towns thereof, and Jeshena with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. Look at verse 20. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in his days of, in the days of Abijah. And the Lord struck him and he died. And Abijah waxed mighty. Glory, hallelujah. Abijah waxed mighty and married 14 wives and begat 20 and 2 sons and 16 daughters and on and on and on and on. That's the story of Abijah. And his sayings are written in the story of the prophet Edo. Glory. What a victory of truth over falsehood. What a victory of righteousness over unrighteousness. What a victory of truth over lie. Lie will be brought to an end. Lying spirits are invading. Lying spirits will lead to ultimate ruin. But truth will bring victory. I commend you to the truth of God's word. Let the truth dwell in your heart richly. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And when this truth dwells richly in our being. And we have truth in our heart. And we declare truth with our mouth. For with the heart man believes in Jesus the Messiah. With the mouth confession is made to salvation. May you return to truth today. May you return to fellowship with God today. And the Lord will bless you. Let us no longer act a lie. Let us never get into the feast of Jeroboam and leave the lie. For lie is, will eventually be overthrown. It is momentary. It is not permanent. May the Lord quicken your heart and mind and all hearers of this word 
be quickened in the name of Jesus. May you come, return to the God of your fathers, return to him, and the power of God's covenant will be at work with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen.